You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data app. So this is, I am just, I need today to be over with. Uh, I stupidly stayed up till about midnight thinking there might be some kind of answers, and then it just became clear. It, it, it probably around 10 o'clock, I knew that we weren't going to know, but it was, like addicting, you know, like new information, like, ooh, you kind of get a little bit more, you know, it's just, I don't know, so it wasn't until like midnight where I was like, dude, what, what exactly is the plan here, because, I mean, what, what are we shooting for, and I realized uh, I was in a lot of trouble, so I went to bed midnight-ish, alarm goes off at three-ish, and it, I, I, it was, it was perfect, I had that adrenaline rush of, ooh, check what's going on, and I did, and, you know, I didn't learn anything, but still, I was awake. Just get up now. Nah, I'm just going to snooze for a minute. Yeah, right. Hour and a half later, I am now simultaneously deliriously tired and uh, extraordinarily late. Technically, if I wrap this thing up in 18 minutes, I can go, uh, you know, to work on time, but that's absurd. Also... Um, super awesome. I decided to skip the actual real pot of coffee, went for the, uh, instant coffee. And I don't know if this was a hundred percent on accident or if there was a little bit of uh, subconsciousness that took over. If you watched my tutorial on how to make instant coffee, the video that I put up a while ago, you'll realize that, um, amateurs scoop and pros pour. I poured about half that, <laughs> that container into my cup. So I needed a bigger receptacle. So that's helping. It is. It's, It's. you know, I really upped my game here. I got a big old thing of instant coffee, and I'm, I'm feeling okay. So anyways, hopefully you're feeling all right. I know a lot of people are really straight. Here, here's where I'm at. And I know some people are going to get all snip. Well, you have the luxury. <laughs> Let's just put it this way, although I do mean this for everybody, but just to try to avoid stupidity. If you're younger and you haven't started your life yet, here's a goal for you. Or, you know, just younger in general. Try to position your life so that the elections don't matter at all. They just don't. In reality, they don't matter for anybody anyways. 
was talking to a friend of mine a while ago, and I was like, what, what, what is one direct impact you've had on your life from a president ever? I don't think he said anything. I could list one thing. I suppose gas prices would be another one. But in general, it just, I mean, it's whatever, dude. But that's the goal. You get to a point in your life where it's like, eh, I'm good. I'm going to keep doing what I do. The more radical your life changes based on who's in office, you're in a bad spot. Get out of that spot. Regardless of, of how good or bad it is when the right person is in office, it's still a bad spot. It's very dangerous. Get away from there. Then when we all get to that spot together, we can collectively start to, you know, I mean, if we, I don't know, I'm getting into dreamy territory now. It'd be kind of nice if we all agreed that that position didn't matter anymore and we just took all their power away and like, you know what, you just sit over there and shut up. Leave us alone. But, you know, that's a dream. Some people actually want somebody that's very powerful with control over their life sitting in Washington. I don't know why, but, you know, that's all right. Just a, just a, just a goal, again, just talking to the young folks, map out a life where that doesn't matter. And again, in reality, we're all pretty much there anyways. I've been a part of, I don't know how many elections, not very many, but every single one has been the most important election of our lives, and it's the end of democracy, blah, blah, blah. And then basically nothing happens, except a lot of annoying bluster. Just just my observation. Anyways, um, obviously, there's, I mean, there's just, there hasn't been any good news in a very long time. When was the last time we had good news about anything? Was it the last time the Packers won a football game or what? It's just, ugh, I don't know. I'm not going negative. I was, I was just going to say, I'm too tired to be negative. This is a great day. And all of a sudden, it's like, ugh, I'm getting into pouty mode. Anyways, whatever. It doesn't matter. The, the Packers didn't make a trade. We don't have Jamal or Kamal Martin or A.J. Dillon. And that's the update for today. And that's not good. I guess we'll start with that. Um, more than likely, what is going to happen is that Dexter Williams will be the starting running back. Uh with Swerve and Irvin as sort of a, I don't want to say a backup. He's not there just in case. You know, I think it's going to have to be uh, Matt LaFleur has to dial up something. And and it really can be to the Packers' advantage. I mean, it's obviously a massive disadvantage. There's a reason Dexter has not even been on the field, you know, from a talent standpoint for Dexter and Tyler Irvin. However, from an uns- unscouted look, but also from the unique dynamic standpoint, In other words, the 49ers have to shift quite a bit in terms of once they realize Tyler Irvin is is a larger part of this offense, that changes what this offense is in terms of its identity. Matt LaFleur has to shift that a bit, the way that this offense operates. Now, that's not entirely true. I suppose Matt LaFleur could just say, eh, we're just not going to run. We're going to throw, 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 in which case I'm fairly confident we're in a lot of trouble, right? Like, I, I know. Here's an idea, guys. Super radical idea. Rodgers, how would you feel about throwing to Devontae all day long? How's that sound? Does that sound like a good plan to you? Because that's kind of what I'm feeling right now. I don't really like our running backs. The other wide receivers are no good. Tight ends are kind of not good. You can just throw it to Devontae all day. I'm hoping there's a a modicum of creativity left in Matt LaFleur. And it's it's weird because the last time we heard him say that, we went on to win. I don't even remember what game it was. The Saints game or the Falcons game, one of those two, where everybody was hurt and we're like, oh no, we're doomed. And Matt's just like, nah, well, it's a great opportunity. We're going to showcase these other guys and it's going to be great. And we did, and it was. Or, right, <laughs> we can showcase the other guys and use Matt LaFleur's creativity to create this really dynamic offense and go on to win. Or we just throw at Devontae all day and lose. I don't know, kind of horse apiece, I guess. But I'm optimistic that we're going to see at least a little bit of... Uh, interesting stuff and I guess the I guess there's nothing wrong with doing somewhat of a breakdown we got the game tomorrow right the real negative thing here is you're looking at it and you're like oh man this whole team is decimated yeah but they kind of got just enough they've got Eric Armstead off the edge who's ranked 23rd and and uh it was a James oh Kerry Hyder who's ranked uh twen- whatever 24th so they're, they're they're decent off the edge um both of them are better against the run than as pass rushers. So there's not a huge amount of pass rush, but neither do the Vikings have a lot of pass rush. What they do have is the ability to say, you know what, we're going to take away the run because, again, we don't have very good running backs. They've got Armstead and Hyder off the edge, and they've got Fred Warner at linebacker, who, um, granted, is much more of a coverage guy than a run defense guy, but he's still a talented, uh, extremely fast, 
you know, think back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as far as if you're trying to use Tyler Irvin to get to the outside, Fred Warner is going to be able to get out there. And we've already learned Corey Lindsay's not going to be able to get up to a guy like Fred Warner in time to cut him off. So, you know, I don't know. It, it, let me can complete this thought first. So that's going to be problematic against the run. And then you say, okay, well, then we're going to throw because their corners aren't that great, with the exception of Jason Verrett right now, who is ranked third best in the NFL. So Jason Verrett, who has come out of out of absolutely nowhere, um, I shouldn't say that. He's just been, or was he been hurt or what? He's been graded out terribly, but he doesn't rank any. I don't know. The only two times he's ever been ranked, 2015 he was second, 2020 he's third. So apparently when he gets a decent amount of snaps, he's very, very good. Guy's just been hurt for three years or something. So what does that mean? The 49ers are a team that have very little going for them defensively, except one corner that's very, very good and a decent ability to stop the run. Golly gee, that stinks. <laughs> now, the one thought I have is um, probably going to be counterintuitive. I think Dexter has some pretty good juice, and Tyler Irvin is pretty quick to the outside. So the, the I think the uh, I don't know, instinct or the, the, the tendency I have a feeling for Matt LaFleur is let's get to the outside. That's what he wants to do anyways is get to the outside. I don't know if it's going to work. Again, Armstead and Hyder are decent run defenders. Eric Armstead's a big dude. Um, his ability to hold an edge with Warner flowing back and forth, making plays, and I'm not saying it's impossible, we can never get it done, but I just don't think that that's the best plan against this particular defense. However, same thing I thought about Tampa, they actually graded out really well against the run. I mean, I'm talking about our offensive line was very good run blocking. They graded out well, but yet it's like, well, Guys like Corey Lindsley couldn't quite reach. Why? How is he grading out so well? The point is, he couldn't reach on the outside plays, but when it was up the middle, the guys in the middle of the defense, as well as the linebackers, aren't actually that good against the run. Now, there's there's different ways to be good against the run. you got linebackers that are really, really fast. you got the Roquans and the Warners and et cetera, et cetera, that are just really quick. And if they have a fl- free running lane to a running back, they'll flow there and take them down. Then you've got sort of the old school linebackers that apparently just don't really exist anymore, which is I'm going to take on a block, shed that block, and bring down the running back. Guys like Warner aren't built that way. So I think if we're going to do it, let's just do it that way. Let's just play big man football. And I know we don't have our big man running backs this week, but oh well. Take on Javon Kinlaw, who's a smaller, you know, pass rushy interior defensive lineman. And Deion Jordan, who's, you know, same kind of situation, 6'6", 284. He's kind of like a Dean Lowry guy. Warner, who's uh, 6'3", 236, the linebacker. These guys are built for speed. I would rather we just smash it up the middle for a while. And then as far as throwing the ball, I mean, it's it's really just a matter of find another way. And, and, And here's the thing with Warner. The benefit of an offense like this, and obviously Shanahan understands this, but understanding it and being able to, to stop it are two different things. You look at it and you say, okay, let's get the tight ends going. Well, what about Warner? He's a really good coverage linebacker. He can only do one of two things. If he's going to split out and cover a, a tight end, which you kind of think he probably won't because you don't need to isolate him on a tight end because we don't have that big of a threat. right? If, if Kittle was on the other side, you'd want your best coverage guy, whether it's a safety or a linebacker or whatever, to cover him you know, and really just lock him down. I don't think they're going to be all that threatened, so I don't know if he's going to be doing... Um, all that. So it's one of those things where you got to make Warner pick a poison, right? If, if you're going to, let's say, run outside zone and you're going to fake that and roll out and Warner bites, because again, you, you've got to be fast to the outside. You should have some open space. That's the benefit of this entire scheme. So Matt LaFleur, the point is Matt LaFleur has to be the guy to take Warner out of this. And if he's hanging back when we're running these play fakes to, to make sure that we're not throwing, fine, then let's hand it off. Because if he's not flowing quickly enough, first of all, Corey Lindsley needs to be able to reach up to Warner, and Tyler Irvin should be flying to the outside to be able to make a play. But again, it's it's going to come down to scheme, because if it's just matchup based, if this is just Mike McCarthy, strength on strength, man on man, I'm looking at it and saying, well, they got a corner that can take away our wide receiver, we got a linebacker that's going to take away our running backs, and then we got a bunch of players that aren't very good at football going up against their players that aren't very good at football. I'm not feeling great about this. Matt LaFleur's got to come through on this one. So, man, I, I, I might be able to get out of here actually on time. I'm going to have to skip ads again, which is just ridiculous. I just, that's fine. Who needs money, right? I think that's what we're going to do. Um, oh, that stinks. 
So let's let's pivot to the Will Fuller thing. I know a lot of people are pretty upset about it. That's one of the rare times I was actually on board with stuff. I think most of the other things didn't really make sense to me. If you saw, I went on uh, YouTube just to test it out. A little, a little Packers thoughts on the way home from work kind of segment. Just to see how that kind of works out. It was okay. It's, it's hard to... You know, when I do the podcast, I can kind of pause this when my brain gets locked up, which is a lot. I, my, my mind just wanders and just goes floating around thinking about other stuff, and then i got to pause it, and then I go back and like, what did I just say? And then i got to, you know, like, oh, okay, and then I start again. All of a sudden, it's just, you're streaming live, and it's like, whoa. Like when you're, you know, got to do a speech in front of your class, and your brain just completely shuts off, and you're standing there like, dude, brain, help. What do I do? And like, I don't know, man, I'm out of here. Peace. But but you're the one that memorized the speech. You can't leave. But I'm scared. Anyways, my thoughts essentially were, and I don't want to spend too much time because obviously we didn't do it, but my thoughts at the time were essentially what I've said here already, and that is that the the trade for Fuller makes sense with the exception of the contract. Now, there's two ways to go about this. Most people seemingly seem to think that the best way to go about this is to get a half a year rental out of Fuller and then move on. I'm just not on board with that. I don't like that because I don't really like our odds of winning a Super Bowl with Fuller. It, it, it drastically increases our odds, but we're giving up a draft pick, which is a future player. We're giving up the future for a couple months of a guy. And then some people are saying, well, you're going to get that back in a compensatory pick. You don't know that. You absolutely don't know that. You know, I, I, I gave the example of Mohamed Sanu. The, the Patriots gave up a second for him, and then he was out of the league next year. And I had a guy say, well, that's a terrible comp because, you know, he was out of the league. And I said, well, that's kind of my point. If the Patriots knew that he was going to be so bad that he was basically worthless and couldn't get a job the next year, would they have given a second-round pick? Of course not. The point is you don't actually know what's going to happen when you pull the trigger. We see that all the time. People trade for guys or pick up guys in free agency and spend a ton of money, and they're just trash. Now, I would assume that wouldn't happen with Kyle Fuller, but maybe he wouldn't be all that good. Maybe he comes here and he's subpar, and he goes on to sign some smaller contract, and we end up getting like a sixth-round compensatory pick. Or he comes here and he shatters his leg week one, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, if he ends up getting hurt during free agency, that's going to hurt the whole process. It's all contingent on him signing somewhere and making a bunch of money. So we're sitting around going, come on, sign somewhere, sign somewhere. It's like, dude, I tore my ACL. I can't even play. Nobody's signing me. I'm sorry. So so just the general idea that, well, let's just assume we're getting a third-round compensatory pick back. It's like you can't do that. You can't base it on an assumption that you don't know. So I, I wasn't in on that because in my mind – what a rental is worth is nowhere near what the what the Texans would be willing to give up. I mean, if you want to give up maybe a fifth round pick to get a half a year worth of Kyle Fuller and then just boot him off the team and hope that we can recoup that in a, in a compensatory pick, cool. Maybe a fourth because then then even if it's only a fifth round compensatory pick, then we went from a fourth to a fifth. I can survive. I can live with that. Which it seems like that's the Packers' thought because they weren't willing to give up more than a fourth, and the Texans wanted a second round pick that's the report coming out is that the Packers stayed steady on a fourth and the Texans wanted a second which kind of goes to prove my point if if they knew 1000 percent they were getting a third round compensatory pick they would give a third for him but nobody not just the Packers that's the other crazy thing about this the Texans held firm on a second but they kept the Packers on the line this whole time it was down to the wire with the Packers meaning nobody was offering better than a fourth round pick so if everybody kicking and screaming about, oh, the Packers are, are just garbage, why wouldn't they do the deal? Probably for the same reason the 30 or the 29, uh, no, 30 other teams wouldn't do it either. 32 minus Packers and Texans. I mean, that's that just, if you automatically could assume a third, even if you didn't need a wide receiver, if you had a little bit of money, why wouldn't you just trade them for a third? You would, but not one team apparently was willing to offer a third. So clearly that line of logic doesn't work in the NFL, as, as in no GMs were thinking that way. My thought is it only makes sense if we're doing this long term, but obviously then you're really ramping up the risk because any what-ifs about his play get amplified. If he's bad 
or just not as good as you thought and you're paying them long term, you're, you're going to have to eat this for a long time, kind of similar to what we're getting with Preston and Billy and maybe Amos and Zedarius too. I don't know if these guys suddenly decide they don't want to play anymore. Um, then, then that's kind of what happens, I guess. But it was just the only way that kind of made sense to me. If you're going to do it, it's not going to be for a rental. I'm just not interested. But again, then you're getting into a situation where you're paying two wide receivers big boy money when you're already tight on cap space. So in a way, neither side really made a whole lot of sense. But it, it does feel important, like massively important that we get this figured out. And, and and the problem is, see, th- this is this is the thing. There's there's three options: short-term rental, which is a bad option because you're you're giving up too much for not enough. The long-term contract, in which you're giving up long-term and you're paying way more than you should, and you're really hurting yourself in terms of um, salary cap, not just for the guys you want to resign, but then you got to look at later on when you want to resign guys like Devonte or Jair or whatever. Then there's the third option, which is do nothing, which at this point seems to mean we're going to keep losing, which also not a great option. However, one common uh, refrain was, you know, what good is it to sign Kyle Fuller when Lazard comes back and and we're kind of back on track? The idea being the how much better of a team we are when Lazard comes back is, is mitigated because Lazard is already, you know, he already gets us over the hump, so we don't really need Fuller. Any. That's that's the general idea. So, I guess best case scenario, Lazard comes back very very quickly, and Aaron Jones comes back very very quickly, and we look back on this and say, how stupid was it that we actually wanted Kyle Fuller? Look how good this offense is. It's really just a matter of what do we do in the meantime, because clearly, as long as we don't have Aaron Jones or Lazard, and we have. And, I, you know, that isn't necessarily a knock on Jamal and AJ as far as their ability to run, but you think about what you can do in the passing game when you have guys like not just Aaron Jones, but Aaron Jones and Jamal both on the, on the field at the same time. The amount of things defenses have to account for really just puts them in a bind and puts Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers in a situation where you just overwhelm defenses, and that's why they look as good as they do. But when you start losing talent to that level, that's when it just becomes problematic. And the problem is things look problematic now, so it... it when you think about the Fuller thing, it's not even a, a short-term rental in terms of just this second half of the year. It's just a couple weeks. I mean, if, if we get Lazard back after this week and Aaron Jones back after this week, we might already be back on track. So let's be optimistic and say, find a way to win this week, and then we're, we're good from here on. You say, well, we're not good because the defense is... Okay, but Fuller has nothing to do with the defense. That the defense is is problematic for way too many reasons to even try to comprehend, and and the idea of going out and getting it, I I would rather get Fuller than a defensive player, as I've already laid out, because this team, if it's going to win, if it's going to do anything, and the only reason Fuller even made sense is because of how good the offense was to start the season, because of the potential of what this offense can be if it has the right pieces. The point is we lost the pieces, and I'm saying let's go get a piece so that we can get back to where we were, because the first four weeks of the season when we had a great offense and no defense, we all thought Super Bowl was imminent. So the defense played no impact whatsoever in our thinking that the de- that the team was going to be a dominant team and possibly win a Super Bowl this year. So what's the point in going out and getting a garbage defensive piece that's not going to help us do anything? Like Quinn and Williams, who I don't think was even on the trade block to begin with. It does nothing. It doesn't move the needle. It doesn't help us stop the run. It doesn't help us get to the quarterback. It does nothing for us. If we're going to do anything this year... It's going to be because we get back to what we were when we started the season, which is one of the most dangerous offenses the Packers have ever put on a football field. We just need to get our guys back. Going forward, do we need to invest in wide receiver? Of course we do. Because apparently it's a very razor-thin thing where if if we lose Lazard, we're, we're done. We're cooked. We're toast. What would be nice is to get another dynamic wide receiver weapon so that if Lazard goes out, we still got two really good guys. Or if Devontae goes out, we still got two really good guys. Or if the new guy goes out, we still got two really good guys. But in the meantime, this is where we're at. And this is going to be a, a not a fun week. It's two teams that are beat up, that are not playing their game. It's going to come down to which uh, coaching staff can come up with the best game plan to overcome the injuries and whatnot. And obviously, that's not in Matt LaFleur's favor. We've seen what the 49ers have done in terms of coming up with a game plan against the Packers and the Packers' ability to come up with a game plan against the 49ers. It was pretty heavily in their favor. Not saying we can't win. I'm just saying let's just get through this week and hope that we get everybody back and get back on track. Because right now, 
with just Devontae and nobody else. We're, we're just we're not a we're just not a good team. Period. And it doesn't matter who we win or against or lose against. If we don't have our guys on the field, we're not going anywhere. And what that means about the future, I don't know. But let's just focus on what we have right now. If we're going to have a shot at this, and I think we still have a shot, stay healthy, get healthy, get the guys back on the field. That's it. That's all I got. I got to go. What a garbage day. Actually, yesterday was garbage day. But anyways, I got to get going. Again, remember, if you're not happy about what's going on with the election, which, I mean, it's like 50-50 right now as far as who wins, as far as the the betting odds or whatever. But as much turmoil as you feel, just, just set a goal. Four years from now, I'm going to be in a position in my life where I don't care anymore. Because my life is in my control, not the guy in Washington's control. I mean, if you don't want to jump on that bandwagon, that's fine. You go ahead and live in misery. I'm going to go ahead and follow that plan. I'm kind of already there. It, it really doesn't impact me very much. And I think if you were actually being honest, it wouldn't impact you all that much either. But, of course, you're not going to be, and I'm going to get a bunch of angry mail about, you know, people whose lives are, you know, we're going to end up in a gulag somewhere or something. Most important, ele- blah, blah, blah. I, yeah, I know. Most important election ever, except the last one and until the next one. Here's what I know. No matter who wins, there's going to be this podcast for at least four more years. Because neither of these two old geriatrics are taking this podcast away from me. Anyways, you folks have yourselves a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.